Chapter 58 Thou hast left thy first love. This is a portion of a sermon at Otsego, Michigan, October 10, 1890. Printed in the Review and Herald, February 3, 1891. I spoke to the people of Otsego from the fourth and fifth verses of the second chapter of Revelation. I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Revelation 2, 4 and 5. The people to whom these words are addressed have many excellent qualities, which are recognized by the true witness. Nevertheless, he says, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Here is a want that will have to be supplied. All the other graces fail to make up the deficiency. The church is counseled to remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 2, 4 through 7. In these words are warnings, reproofs, threatenings, promises from the true witness. He that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. Revelation 1, 20. When this church is weighed in the balance of the sanctuary, it is found wanting, having left its first love. The true witness declares, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Revelation 2, 2 and 3. Notwithstanding all this, the church is found wanting. What is the fatal deficiency? Thou hast left thy first love. Is not this our case? Our doctrines may be correct. We may hate false doctrine and may not receive those who are not true to principle. We may labor with untiring energy, but even this is not sufficient. What is our motive? Why are we called upon to repent? Thou hast left thy first love. Let each member of the church study this important warning and reproof. Let each one see if in contending for the truth if in debating on the theory he has not lost the tender love of Christ, has not Christ been left out of the sermons and out of the heart? Is there not danger that many are going forward with a profession of the truth, doing missionary work, while the love of Christ has not been woven into the labor? This solemn warning from the true witness means much. It demands that you shall remember from whence you are fallen, and repent, and do the first work, or else, says the true witness, I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Revelation 2, 5. Oh, that the church might realize its need of its first ardor of love. When this is wanting, all other excellences are insufficient. The call to repentance is one that cannot be disregarded without peril. 
A belief in the theory of truth is not enough. To present this theory to unbelievers does not constitute you a witness for Christ. The light that gladdened your heart when you first understood the message for this time is an essential element in your experience and labors, and this has been lost out of your heart and life. Christ beholds your lack of zeal and declares that you have fallen and are in a perilous position. Present love and law together. In presenting the binding claims of the law, many have failed to portray the infinite love of Christ. Those who have so great truths so weighty reforms to present to the people have not had a realization of the value of the atoning sacrifice as an expression of God's great love to man. Love for Jesus and Jesus' love for sinners have been dropped out of the religious experience of those who have been commissioned to preach the gospel, and self has been exalted instead of the Redeemer of mankind. The law is to be presented to its transgressors, not as something apart from God, but rather as an exponent of his mind and character. As the sunlight cannot be separated from the sun, so God's law cannot be rightly presented to man apart from the divine author. The messenger should be able to say, in the law is God's will, come, See for yourselves that the law is what Paul declared it to be, holy and just and good. It reproves sin. It condemns the sinner. But it shows him his need of Christ, with whom is plenteous mercy and goodness and truth. Though the law cannot remit the penalty for sin, but charges the sinner with all his debt, Christ has promised abundant pardon to all who will repent and believe in his mercy. The love of God is extended in abundance to the repenting, believing soul. The brand of sin upon the soul can be effaced only through the blood of the atoning sacrifice. No less an offering was required than the sacrifice of him who was equal with the Father. The work of Christ, his life, humiliation, death, and intercession for lost man magnifies the law and makes it honorable. Many sermons preached upon the claims of the law have been made without Christ, and this lack has made the truth inefficient in converting souls. Without the grace of Christ, it is impossible to take one step in obedience to the law of God. Then how necessary that the sinner hear of the love and power of his Redeemer and friend. While the ambassador for Christ should plainly declare the claims of the law, he should make it understood that none can be justified without the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Without Christ, there can be only condemnation and a fearful looking for of fiery indignation and final separation from the presence of God. But he whose eyes have been opened to see the love of Christ will behold the character of God as full of love and compassion. God will not appear as a tyrannical, relentless being, but as a father longing to embrace his repenting son. The sinner will cry with the psalmist, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Psalm 103, 13. All despair is swept from the soul when Christ is seen in his true character. The third angel's message in verity. Some of our brethren have expressed fears that we shall dwell too much upon the subject of justification by faith, but I hope and pray that none will be needlessly alarmed, for there is no danger in presenting this doctrine as it is set forth in the Scriptures. 
If there had not been a remissness in the past to properly instruct the people of God, there would not now be a necessity of calling special attention to it. The exceeding great and precious promises given us in the Holy Scriptures have been lost sight of to a great extent, just as the enemy of all righteousness designed that they should be. He has cast his own dark shadow between us and our God, that we may not see the true character of God. The Lord has proclaimed himself to be merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Several have written to me, inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. The Review and Herald, April 1, 1890.